I am assuming that at least some of you out there in the audience looked at the program and saw the title of this session and thought to yourselves, why on earth would we want to compare professional sports and the gallery world? I'm thinking this is especially the, the case because I assume that there are also some of you who specifically got involved in the arts to avoid the worst case scenarios of sports. I'm talking about things like Rocky-esque training regimens where you're beating up sides of meat in a cold storage locker, being yelled at by middle-aged men in windbreakers, and even getting a stupid haircut for the sake of team unity. This is the kind of stuff that we got into the gallery system to avoid, right? However, there are also a number of ways when you start to look at the structure of these businesses that they are actually very similar. And some of these are actually really fundamental and as old as they get, some of them are newer. We'll, we'll cover both really quickly. The first and oldest and kind of most fundamental of these is the fact that both galleries and professional sports require leaps of faith. These are both low probability of success pursuits to base your life around. Obviously, only a very small number of professional athletes manage to make a living doing what they're doing. Even fewer people manage to own professional sports clubs of any kind. And galleries, as we know, are not an easy business to be in. Now, what are the odds of success in the gallery business? This is a, like a very difficult thing to quantify. As we all know, in many ways, the gallery system, when it comes to sharing information, is a black box wrapped in a veil, thrown into a river under cover of darkness. Like, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that we just don't know about. But what we do know is that most galleries are small businesses, and we have a lot of information about small businesses in general. So this is from a report by the US Small Business Administration that was released a couple of years ago. What they tell us about small businesses in general is that only about 20% of them survive their first year. Of that group, only about 10% manage to reach year number five. And again, out of that group, only about 3% manage to make it 10 years. And this isn't just something that recently happened. To quote the report, this has been remarkably consistent over the years. Again, this is one way that we can imagine that pro sports and the gallery system are similar. But it's not the only one. Some of them are much more recent and kind of uh, maybe even more difficult to deal with. The one that I want to focus on today is the idea that over the course of the past generation, professional sports and the gallery system have both become star systems. What this means is that your ability to succeed over the long term increasingly depends on your ability to work with star level talent. So as ridiculous as it might seem at a glance to put LeBron James, Jeff Koons, Lionel Messi, and Yayoi Kusama on the same slide, the reality is that in their own disciplines, each of these people carries the same kind of outsized ability to draw in audiences, to draw in revenue, and to keep their teams, either literal or figurative, at the top of their industries. I said that this is recent, and this helps us quantify it. Now, I of course understand that auction data is not primary market data. We both know that those are different things. However, we also know that you can't have a strong secondary market for an artist if you don't first have a strong primary market for that artist. So with that in mind, this is a chart that was put together with data from the Artnet Price database. And what it shows is worldwide sales of contemporary art at auction between 1988 and 2018. The stretch I want to focus on is between 2000 and 2014 when the market peaked. And I'll just say for reference, for anybody else who is as much of a giant nerd as I am, we're defining contemporary artists as artists born after 1945. This prevents us from falling into the traps that sometimes auction houses set, where, for instance, you can have a Leonardo da Vinci in a contemporary sale, and then all of a sudden he's a contemporary artist. So this keeps us out of that. Over that stretch, what you're looking at is the fact that in 2000, Worldwide sales of contemporary artists at auction generated about $130.5 million. Now that's a lot in comparison to where it was in 1988. But in between 2000 and 2014, that figure jumped 19 fold and ended up at over $2.5 billion. That is a colossal jump in value. 
And what's important about this is that it's not as if every contemporary artist is sharing in that gain equally. This is a chart that just shows the same thing, contemporary art sales worldwide at auction, but this is just over the first six months of 2019. What you see here is that out of $940 million about of sales by value, the top 50 contemporary artists by value generated $662 million of that total. That's over 71%. The other thousands of contemporary artists at auction collectively generated $277 million, which is less than 30%. That's a hair-raising statistic. And it is a hair-raising statistic because, of course, there are way more than 50 galleries out there, which means that it's not as if every gallery has a star that they can depend on in order to survive. Overall, you start to look at a gallery system that is dependent on stars and not everyone can have a star. It reminds me of a quote from a basketball player named Michael Ray Richardson who played for the New York Knicks in the 1970s. And in the middle of a particularly disastrous season, a journalist asked him in the locker room after a game, Michael, how's the season going? And Richardson responded, the ship be sinking. And that's what it feels like for a lot of contemporary galleries right now. It feels like the ship is sinking. Now, as Kenny pointed out earlier, you can also argue that it's always been sinking and this is not any different than it ever has been. But I think that the star system aspect changes the game a little bit. Now, before I continue, I just want to point out that there is, of course, no moral necessity for everybody who starts gallery to be able to continue operating until the end of time. It's a business like any other. It's your job to go out and put together a program that people are going to be interested in, to try to find a way to engage your audience, to try to overcome the challenges. That said, the deck is increasingly stacked against the average person who wants to start a gallery. It's become bad enough that you have a lot of people who are out there who are trying to suggest solutions for how to stabilize the system. One of those people was David Zwerner, who in April of 2018 got on stage at a conference like this one and suggested the idea of an art fair tax. Now, the idea here would be that since big galleries have way more resources and they have the ability to pay more, they can pay more for the booth at any fair. And by virtue of them paying more than smaller galleries that are more vulnerable if things don't go well at that same fair, those galleries can pay less. Other people have also suggested the idea that maybe booth fees should be based on the amount of sales that you actually do at the fair. So if you don't do well, you're not penalized further for the fact that you're overpaying for the booth to begin with. With all due respect to the people who are making these art fair based solutions, I don't think they go far enough. To me, it's sort of like talking to somebody who hasn't eaten a decent meal in a week and saying, hey, I got you. Here you go. You serve them up a couple of ketchup packets. It's too little too late. It's not going to really do anything. In a star-based gallery system, if you wanted to do something structural, what you would do, potentially, one option, is to try to do something to regulate the movement of stars. And if you're going to talk about the, the movement of stars, you inevitably have to talk about poaching. Now again, Kenny talks a lot about the idea of poaching. It's something that has always been a part of the system. And it comes from the fact that there is a fundamental imbalance within different levels of galleries. To take a hypothetical example, you have a major, major gallery like Agosian, and then you have a smaller gallery like Joe Kennedy's unit London, which Joe was on stage with me earlier today. Again, this is strictly hypothetical. I'm not saying that Gagosian poached any of Joe's artists. Um, it's just an example to illustrate the fact that, hypothetically, if Gagosian were interested in one of Joe's artists, they could go to that artist and say, hey, look, we can pay you X amount of money. We can give you X amount of opportunities right now. Our institutional connections are better. It creates a situation where it becomes hard for that artist to say no. This is just the reality of the system. Professional sports have the same imbalance. You can look at it in American baseball, where you have a major market team like the New York Yankees against a smaller market team like the St. Louis Cardinals. And at some level, those two teams of varying sizes, varying resources, are competing for the same players. To get it closer to home, it also happens in European football. 
you can have a major market club like Arsenal, which plays in the English Premier League, looking at talent in a French club, it's much smaller, called, say, Lille LOSC. Now, the difference between this imbalance in the gallery system and this imbalance in athletics is that pro sports have taken this imbalance as a fact of life. They understand that there is going to be poaching. They understand that rising stars are probably, almost inevitably, going to end up going to larger markets. No matter how much time they spent in a smaller market being developed by people who are putting in blood, sweat, and tears when that person was an undependable, unknown quantity. The system that FIFA, which is the international governing body for football leagues worldwide, put in to try to solve this problem, it's called transfer fees. Transfer fees are exactly what they sound like. First off, this is not a thing that they just came up with on the back of an envelope and were like, oh, we'll throw this in. The actual transfer fee rules cover 83 pages. It's an incredibly intricate dissection of how this thing is supposed to work. But the gist is that it covers rising stars who are going to larger foreign clubs. And when those stars move, what happens is that the club that is acquiring that star pays compensation to the club that is losing that star. And in FIFA's case, that compensation is just straight cash. It's either a preset buyout amount that is in the player who's moving, that's in their contract, or if there's no preset buyout amount, the club that's acquiring them pays the prorated portion of their contract with the club that they're leaving. The point of all of this is that the entire system has been designed to try to work for everybody. It's supposed to be major market clubs working with small market clubs to get to sustainability. To give you a sense of the scale of some of these deals, because I, I criticized the art fair solutions earlier because I just don't think they do that much. This is a piece that was in the Financial Times last weekend, which uh, I have to thank Claudia Schockenman for uh, alerting me to. But it covers the two football clubs that I mentioned earlier, a transfer between those two clubs. So the gentleman whose picture there in the photo is named Nicholas Pepe. He's a winger. And Arsenal acquired him for a fee of 80 million euros from Lille, the, the French club that he was a part of before that. And in fact, the owner of Lille has developed an entire business model strictly around the idea that what they are going to do is develop players so that they can be poached, which is kind of a crazy idea if you think about it. It seems like it at first, but according to the owner of this team, in the course of the past two years alone, this strategy has generated over 200 million euros for them. So this is a big difference from saying like, oh, we're going to knock 10% off of your art fair booth cost. Like this is a major, major shift. Again, lots of money. Anyhow, let's take it back to the gallery system. Now, the first person that I know of to talk about this idea of transfer fees for galleries is a collector and analyst named Alain Servet, who I'm sure some of you in the audience know. And I believe he first proposed it in a speaking engagement back in 2012, and it's come up a few times in the discourse since then. But the basics of it seem, on the surface, pretty easy to deal with. Again, the talent involved would be rising star artists moving from a smaller gallery to a larger gallery. The compensation is something that would have to be worked out. You could do a few different things. In theory, you could also just do straight cash. You could do it so that the gallery that's acquiring the artist pays a sales commission of some amount for some set amount of time to the gallery that they acquired that star from. Or you could have the artist just make a set number of works for the gallery that he's leaving, hands it off to them, and then they have the ability to hold them, to sell them, whatever. They, they can control when they, they capitalize off of those assets. But they have something in their pockets that they can fall back on. So it's not like they're being left with absolutely nothing. So it seems like an interesting idea, right? There's one thing, though, that we have to go back to. If we look at what we just talked about with the idea of, of transfer fees for galleries, there's an element of this slide that is missing that we had on the element of the FIFA transfer fees slide. 
that comes down to regulation. I mentioned that there is an 83-page set of guidelines for how transfer fees work in FIFA's governing bylaws. We don't have anything like that in the art market, of course. In order to have something like it, we would need to have representation contracts. That would be the equivalent of the contracts that football players, baseball players, any sport, that they have with the teams that employ them. And those contracts are what make a transfer fee system actionable. And as we just heard about a little bit in the last panel, contracts are not something that very many people want to get involved with. As somebody who worked in the gallery system for several years and has been involved in trying to get artists to sign contracts, I can tell you from personal experience, trying to get the average artist to sign a contract is about as appealing to them as trying to get them to take over a, an alligator that you just fished out of the sewer. Like, it's not something that they have any interest in taking on. So if contracts are this big a problem, it raises the question of whether this entire idea is hopeless. I don't think so. And I don't think so specifically because of the pro sports example. An interesting thing that happens if you start to go back in time and look at the timelines, at least in the US, of the gallery system and professional baseball, you find out that they actually operate on fairly similar chronologies. So Nodler, which we all know kind of ended in infamy after a, a gigantic forgery scandal, um, was nevertheless the first commercial gallery that was established in the US. And that was all the way back in 1846. 25 years later, we had the beginnings of the first professional baseball league in 1871. The National Association of Baseball Players was so old school that they actually separated baseball into two words. Like, that's not a typo. That's actually what it was like. But if you fast forward to the present day, there are huge differences in the way that these two systems have developed. This is not necessarily an all-inclusive example, but this is a pitcher in Major League Baseball named Garrett Cole, who was just signed by the New York Yankees two months ago for a nine-year, $324 million contract, which is a colossal amount of money. And again, it's set down in writing in a contract that governs his employment and that his club can then use to trade or hold on to his rights. It's, it gets very complicated very quickly. But it hasn't been a kind of gradual, I guess it's been a gradual shift, but the majority of this kind of change when it comes to baseball and other professional sports has actually happened a lot more recently than you might think. This is another pitcher. His name is Nolan Ryan. He started in the major leagues when he was, well, I, I believe it was in the late 1970s. He's now in the Hall of Fame. He's retired. But at the time when Nolan Ryan, who was at least as good a pitcher as Garrett Cole, came into professional baseball, at that point, the game and the rules around the game were still so underdeveloped that most players actually had second jobs in the offseason to make ends meet. Nolan Ryan, one of the greatest pitchers of all time, spent his first offseason in the league installing air conditioners. So what changed? What changed is partially the structure of professional sports. Now, Obviously, each league has its own variations, but in general, we can break things down like this. So when it comes to talent, which is the players, they compete on the job, but they unionize off of it. It's actually impossible to be a professional athlete without being a part of a player's union. Management, meaning the people who own the clubs, same situation. If you're on a game day, these people want to beat each other's heads in, but as soon as a labor issue comes up, they gather together and they try to figure out a way to pull in the same direction and get the best deal that they possibly can. Another key element of this is governance. Now, every professional sports league has a central commissioner, either an individual or a governing body that oversees both sides of this. They work with the players and they work with the people who own the clubs, to try to make sure that the entire system can operate in a cohesive way. And they do this by establishing these large-scale agreements that cover hundreds of pages that codify every single thing you could possibly think about in terms of both the rules of the game itself and the rules of the business that's built around that game. So 
in capsule, this is what the structure of professional sports looks like. If we change over and we start to think about the structure of the professional gallery system, <laughs> it gets ugly very quickly. Some of you, I'm sure, know this is a uh, screenshot of a WWE, a World Wrestling Entertainment event. It's called Battle Royale. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a bunch of guys who get into the ring and beat the crap out of each other until there's only one man left. If we want to get more specific here and just do the absolute one-to-one -one comparison, let's look at the talent. So artists, they compete against one another, period. I'm not saying that they're not friendly with one another and they don't collaborate on projects and things like that, but when it comes to the actual labor issues, there is no real meaningful artists union out there. There are some in Europe, there are none in the US whatsoever. And based on the research that I've managed to do, even the ones that exist in Europe are not particularly strong, not anywhere near what you get with a, a, prof, uh, a players union or professional sports league. Management, meaning the owners of the gallery, same situation. There are, of course, professional associations, but they're optional. And we'll cover that a little bit more in a second. Governance, again, there's no real third parties. There's no commissioner of the gallery system to oversee everybody and make sure that they're getting along. And the internal rules, of course, we have no collective bargaining agreement. We have no hundreds of pages of long documents showing how this whole thing is supposed to work. The best thing that we have are a series of optional codes of conduct that either come from a professional association, like, say, the Art Dealers Association of America, or you have an event-specific code of conduct like Art Basel premiered at the end of 2018. And for comparison, and this is not a criticism of those documents for the record, but just so we understand what we're dealing with, the types of rules that you have in the Art Basel code of conduct are as basic as if you sell an artwork at Art Basel, you have to pay the artist. I mean, you would hope that would go without saying, but apparently it, it needs to be said. Okay, so now that we see that there are actually these colossal differences between the way that the gallery system is structured and the way that the professional sports world is structured, it begs the question of how professional sports became so codified and so structured. And there's a lot of ways you can answer this question, but the thing I want to focus on is a phrase I mentioned earlier, which is collective bargaining. Collective bargaining is exactly what it sounds like. Basically what you have is two groups with competing interests who elect representatives to come together into a room with an independent arbitrator and try to work out an agreement. It comes up, not just in professional sports, it comes up in all kinds of labor contexts. Any union battle ends up being a collective bargaining situation. Here's the thing about collective bargaining. It makes sense in a professional sports context, and it could make sense in a gallery context. It would be a little bit different because usually it's workers against employers. Um, the worker case in the art world would be artists, and we just talked about artists don't even have a union to begin with. And I don't think that you want to base the whole system on whether or not artists are ever going to unionize because talking to some of the most labor relations active artists that I know, they just tell me that's never going to happen. So I think in a gallery context, what you would have to do, would you, would, you would have to have representatives from galleries that are working at different levels of the market coming together and trying to figure out how you could stabilize the system for everybody involved. So you would have, for instance, just to take, say you took the representatives of two different optional professional associations. You took representatives from the American Art Dealers Association of America, the ADAA, and you put them together with uh, representatives from NADA, the New Art Dealers Alliance, which usually covers artists, or I'm sorry, covers galleries that are, that are much lower on the price spectrum, more emerging, that kind of thing. It's a nice idea, but there's another thing that we have to talk about here. It's not just the how of the way the professional sports manage to structure up. We also have to talk about the why. And the why comes down to money in a lot of cases. And if we think about the original revenue stream of professional sports way back at the very beginning, it was very simple. It was ticket sales. These leagues grew out of the idea that people were going to physically show up to an event and buy a ticket so they could watch a game or a match in person. That is no longer the case. 
in the years since, what has happened is that the demand for these sports has progressed into a way that you have all of these different types of ways that people want to interact with these games. For instance, TV broadcast rights. It's no longer just people who want to go to the games in person. You have a bunch of people who want to watch it at home, on TV, at a bar, on TV, whatever. And TV rights are an incredibly lucrative revenue stream for professional sports leagues. Just to give you one data point, the English Premier League currently has a TV rights deal that covers three years and swells to $12 billion. That is a colossal amount of money. But it's not all. There are also corporate sponsorships. Corporations want to be engaged with these professional sports teams. Everything from sponsoring the jerseys or the kits that the players wear to running promotions at the arenas. All of these things are other ways that professional sports leagues and professional sports clubs manage to make money. And then, of course, you also have merchandise. If you have fans of the team, they want to show that they're fans of the team. They'll go out and they'll buy a jersey or a kit or they'll buy a towel with a logo of their favorite team, whatever. There are infinite options, and again, it brings in millions and millions of dollars every year. Let's go back to the gallery system. So what's the original revenue stream in contemporary galleries? The answer, of course, is art sales. The difference is that they don't really have any other consistent revenue streams that get anywhere near to what we see in professional sports. It's really just art sales. Obviously, there are corporate sponsorship situations. You'll see corporations sponsor art fairs, but you're never going to really see or rarely see, I think, a corporation going and saying, like, hey, we want to sponsor this exhibition at your commercial gallery. It just doesn't happen. And the merchandise thing we kind of talked about earlier, at least in, in my panel with the things like the Gagosian shop and, and whatever else, that's still an outlier. It's not a consistent everyday part of every gallery. And so I think that it leaves us in a scenario where the gallery system is still depending on the same stream of money that it has always depended on, and that limits the amount of options. So given all of these differences that we've encountered, it kind of begs the question, what sport is the gallery system most like at the end of the day? After talking to an artist named William Pohida, who thinks about this stuff a lot and makes work specifically about this issue, he gave what I think is the best answer. And the answer is that the best comparison isn't professional football, isn't professional baseball, isn't professional basketball. It's none of the big sports that we really think of as being huge draws for people. It's probably horse racing. Why is it probably horse racing? Well, let's cover some data points here. First off, there are no strong talent unions in horse racing. There is a jockey's guild, believe it or not, but it is so weak that it turns out that the jockeys, even in the biggest events in horse racing, get paid less than $100 to compete. And of course, the horses are not unionizing. That also means that there are no guaranteed contracts and no guaranteed salaries. Again, similar situation with artists. On top of that, there is no sustained mass audience. There is a sustained audience, but not a sustained mass audience. I have an asterisk up there because there are, in each case, a couple of different times a year where you can get a, a sort of critical mass of people that doesn't usually show up to these things. The shortest and sweetest way I can say it is that you can think of the Kentucky Derby as the Art Basel Miami Beach of horse racing, and you can think of Art Basel Miami Beach as the Kentucky Derby of the art world. So what that means is that the real base in each of these instances, in both horse racing and the gallery system, is a few thousand wealthy people who are primarily engaging by making big bets on who is going to succeed in an extremely competitive situation. Either that or you have a larger mass of people who are largely just passively viewing this thing. You can watch the Kentucky Derby on TV. You can go to a gallery show and walk around and not buy anything. And that's totally fine. That's just the way that these things operate. So in light of all that, 
I don't think that there's an immediate pot of gold waiting on the other side of collective bargaining agreements uh, for the gallery system. I, they're not going to come out of the boardroom and say, hey, we figured out a way to govern the transfer of artists from gallery to gallery, and now, thank you very much, I will take your deal for $12 billion for the TV rights to this. Like, that's just not going to happen. What that means instead is that if collective bargaining or any kind of other major concessions or changes are going to happen in the gallery system, it's going to have to come out of something that is much more abstract and much more long-term. Again, this issue of sustainability, which was the goal of FIFA transfer fees in the first place. The idea of major galleries and smaller galleries working together because they believe that the value of the system itself is more important than any other obstacles that might be in front of them. Now, that isn't an easy process. It's not one that I would be anxious to initiate on my own if I were a part of this. But as they say in sports, no pain, no gain, right? That's all I've got. Thank you. Hola. Thank you for another closing uh, session, as last year. Um, it's that insightful and leaves lots of questions and things to, 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 to keep on thinking. So I invite if, uh, comments and questions for, for Tim. Um, see. Hello, Tim. Thank you for the talk. So I have a comment, may not necessarily a question, but I really want your feedback on this idea. So you mentioned about the star system is really like running the art world, and we can observe uh, a lot of major brands, like major um, like art brands, like Sotheby's, they're doing collaboration with uh, celebrities, like they do this art, um, old master sales with uh, Victoria Beckham. So I think it's really like the art industry, how they can draw the mass audience is through like collaborating with stars, like the Sotheby's also did one with this Korean K-pop star. But the, the, the thing for the smaller galleries is the problem, they don't have the fame or they don't have the fund to really inviting these celebrities to even raise the fame of the brands or even doing collaborative artworks, which I think would be draw a broader audience. So my idea is like whether is the art industry could really start up a, a patrons program or a fund with like maybe the aspiring collectors or people interested in the industry, they can deposit some money or membership fee. And once that can really fund a smaller gallery to, to um, create a program, so maybe they have these artists that they want to do celebrities collaborations, they can propose to these celebrities and then they, they create a program, and then they can invite these uh, patrons over to private views. So and maybe that can be the sustainable way to do that business. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting idea, for sure. And there are a few things that exist out there that play into that one way or another. For instance, at least uh, the fair that runs concurrently for our Basel every year, there is a program that they run called Friends of Lisa, which is just a collection of patrons who give a set amount of money to the to the organization and they use that to defray the costs of first time or second time calories going to show at the fair. So again it's it's this idea of people saying, well I believe in this system. I believe that I want an art world to exist that's rich and not in a monetary sense, but has diversity and has a a variety of different ways that you can, uh, or levels that you can relate to it at, and I'm going to try to fund that in a very direct manner. Um, and I think that uh, the other thing I'll add is also just that the, the great irony of the whole poaching situation is that it proves that the system works. It's like if the idea of smaller galleries developing artists so that they could then eventually become bigger stars, if that wasn't viable, the big galleries would be poaching those artists to begin with. So it's not necessarily that the system is broken per se, it's just a matter of saying like, well, if we like this, if we think that this is the way that things should work, and we understand that this is probably a fact of life, like what ways might we be able to control for that in some in some way, shape, or form? And you know, this was one possibility, and there are many, many others that are out there. I think. So that's a really long term issue. Yeah, it is, and and this is the, the problem is that long term issues are super not sexy. Like people want 
immediate, like they want simple answers to questions now. And I think that has gotten us into a lot of trouble in a lot of different walks of life. And the reality is that these are hard problems that are probably going to take a lot of effort and a lot of time to fix. And that means that it's, it's difficult to start the process. But I, I don't think that there's any way of getting around it. Oh, actually, um, when you think about like a new market, like where I'm from in China, it's a huge trend to do these celebrities or like these um, uh, like superstars. They need some um, um, art to brand themselves. Or like KOLs, K opinion leaders, like bloggers, they don't have any like this artistic flair. So there's a big trend for these uh, small, not, not smaller galleries, but like a smaller artist the brands. They go to China and then they find a collaboration with these kind of celebrities. And then the celebrities give them this uh, traffic. I mean the um, what's it called the the uh, uh, what's the word I forgot. The conversion, yes, and also the publicity, and then um, the and on the other hand, the the person like the the Chinese su superstars, they get this artistic feel. So maybe that's a new market is an opportunity. You may have just voiced a startup idea. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi, thank you for this presentation. I was actually really excited about it when I saw it in the program because. Um, I come from a family of uh, sports people. I'm from Serbia and we're big in basketball. Mm -hmm. So I happen to know a lot of uh, agents that have dealt with the uh, transfers and stuff into the NBA. Um, and Alain Serve did have this idea in one of the talking galleries a couple of years ago. Um, and the difference being, of course, as you mentioned, that the difference in the system is that also you don't have this middle person, which would be the agent, right? Um, I just wanted to point out to some things that do happen in the professional sports that are not so great and whether this could happen in the art world. Um, so like it does happen that um, players get transferred from the European League to the NBA League and they were stars in the European League but then in the NBA because there are so many stars they end up sitting on the bench getting a lot of money sure but sitting on the bench but then when their contracts are expired and they need to get back to Europe, nobody wants them because they know they kind of haven't really been playing for a while. So that's the end of their career. Um, so that's just bad agency. Um, at the same time, it can also happen that some players, um, the agent kind of tells them that it's better to go to another team for more money, even though that team is not doing as well as the current team of the players. So that's also kind of the end of a career. So my question would be, could it also happen, you know, that a big gallery gets a rising star but doesn't get to show him as much because there's other stars in that gallery and therefore maybe that artist would have been better off staying in the original gallery? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that that actually happens a lot more often than we tend to think when we talk about this issue. There are a lot of cases, I'm not going to name names, but I think that... Most of, or at least some of, the biggest galleries out there have more or less shown that they're not really that interested in cultivating young artists' careers. And I think it has actually been detrimental to some artists to say, make the jump as soon as humanly possible. Um, the whole idea of, of coming up with a smaller gallery, whether that's a small gallery that's operating a storefront on the Lower East Side, or a gallery that's operating in the always talked about middle of the market. The idea is that those people have a real investment in trying to get the artist to the next level, and you don't always have that. Like, the reason that poaching happens is because, in theory, galleries are saying, oh, this person is more or less a finished product, or like the amount of caring and nurturing and developing that I have to do with them is pretty small at this point. And so I think that that is somewhat of an example of what you're talking, or parallel for what you're talking about, where you can have somebody who looks like they're set to be a star player when they're coming up in Europe, and all of a sudden they end up on the Knicks or the Lakers or whatever, and then it just turns out that they weren't ready yet. And the team may not have the development staff to get them to an NBA level ready or, or whatever, or NBA ready level, excuse me. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are always problems with these things. Nothing is nothing is going to be perfect ever. But I think it's it's more dangerous to say, well... This isn't a perfect solution, so we might as well not talk about it at all. Hey. 
Yeah. 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 Um, I had a question that's not too dissimilar from what she just said. So I, I believe in professional sports, people like insure their arms or their legs. Um, <laughs> and in actually, their whole, their whole bodies. Their whole bodies. But yeah. But how does that kind of longevity exist in this model if transferred to the gallery model? Like, how do you protect right. talent in that kind of you know, ecosystem? Yeah, I think that it's, well, the reason that you can ensure, why athletes can ensure themselves against cases of injury, which means that, of course, they, they can't work, they can't play, so they can't earn money. The reason that those insurance policies exist is because those sports have managed to reach a level of profitability that insurance companies can see those as good bets. And the gallery system, I don't think is at a, like, I, I'm not sure that, um, I don't know, could Nicholas party go out tomorrow and, and get a, an insurer to cover his hands in case that he like gets his hand crushed in the door and he can't pay for, for a while. Probably not. But, um, I think that, I think that what you're what you're asking about just speaks to the fact that there are all of these nuances within this larger construct of saying like okay well once we decide we're going to do we're going to try to regulate for this thing then we have to ask this second level question or this third level question and it illustrates the fact that once you start to really think about it it just becomes really difficult really quickly and I think that turns a lot of people off um, I, I don't know that there is a good solution or that I even have an answer for it. I, all I can say is that, yeah, you're right. You, you can't, we can't just pull one lever and say, okay, now these two worlds are similar enough that we can just use the exact playbook from professional sports and just transfer it all onto the gallery system and everything is going to make complete sense. I don't think that's the case. And you're going to have to retrofit it in some way or another, but do the basic underlying issues make sense or, or offer a possible solution? Maybe. Um, on that note, in Germany, it's very possible to have an insurance as an artist. You tell them what you make roughly. Uh, you give them, if you have a contract with a gallery, that information. And then it's a normal um, insurance if you lose your ability to do your work. And so if you are a performance artist that dances, you say, well, I need my hands and feet to do that. Or if you paint, then it's predominantly your hands. So um, I don't know about the rest of the world, but I think you could possibly look into that. Um, I've worn many hats throughout my career as um, I worked at Artsy at some point, but I'm also a conceptual artist. And uh, just a thought on the, the sport we could compare the art world to closest, I guess, would be hiking. Hiking is something you can only do if you are um, in, in a place where you have free time. You don't need any ability to go hiking. Anyone can do it on their weekends. Um, but once you get to a climbing Mount Everest level, you need a team, you need preparation, you need a lot more time. And then the number of people that make it in hiking to like a level where everybody knows their names is even fewer. So it's kind of like a very low entry point. And I think the problem with sports, we have very clear rules what the abilities are you have to bring to the table to even be eligible to compete. Whereas with art, we might even discover a new form of art tomorrow. And then that person is an artist and gets to play with it. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, just a thought on that. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. I, I hadn't thought of hiking or, or like rock climbing. As you started saying that, I started thinking about, did anybody else see Free Solo? The most terrifying movie I've seen in my entire life. It's about this guy who just who climbs mountains without any kind of harness or anything, and if he slips, he dies. Um, that seems actually really parallel to artists in a lot of ways, because it is such a high-risk kind of endeavor to devote your life to. Unless you're more from North Carolina, more like recreational hiking. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah, so I was thinking about the fact that this might be a leverage problem from the standpoint of the gallery and the artist. Let's say, for example, you get an artist that's poached from your, um, from your base, and uh, you actually hold, withhold like, some of the inventory of that, of that artist. He goes to a big gallery, and he makes a big. At the end, that inventory that you're holding is your leverage for him leaving you. And it's the same thing as in a sports team when they do a transfer. Sometimes there's uh, special fees. Like, let's say this player wins the Champions League next season. The club is probably going to get some money out of that. They also measure the amount of games they played. So I think 
as a contract goes on two sides, there's an intrinsic leverage on this point. What would you say about that? Well, I mean, I think that that's definitely a conversation. Like, if you decide that as a gallerist, you are going to essentially hold you, some of your artist's work back on the possibility that something could go wrong. I mean, I'm assuming that you're saying this like, oh, yeah, I'm going could... to keep this in case you decide that you're going to go to Hauser & Worth. Yeah, like tomorrow. leverage. Right, exactly. And I think that that just, that gets to the, the crux of what we're talking about here, where if that's just something that you as a gallerist decide that you're going to do without there being any kind of conversation about it beforehand, I think it's going to really mess up that relationship with the artist very quickly. It suddenly becomes very adversarial, and it becomes adversarial in retrospect. Like, it's one thing, and this is why contracts, in theory, are a good idea. It's before you guys get into the relationship, you get together and you talk about the idea, like, hey, here's how we're going to do this. You're going to consign me X amount of works, and I'm going to hold that as a backup in case you jump ship to a bigger gallery. If people know that going in, that's one thing. I mean, I'm not saying it's not going to still be contentious, because I'm sure it is. But it's a lot more of an even-handed exchange if everyone knows that before the relationship gets started, as opposed to you've been working together for two years and all of a sudden that artist starts asking like, hey, what about that, uh, that white painting that I gave you last year? Where is that? And you're like, oh, I've got that in a storage locker in case you decide that you're going to cheat on me. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't see that going well personally, but that's just me. Oh, yeah, it's just going like straightforward with it from the beginning, you know? Yeah, like right, exactly. Practice. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and again, like that's... Like contracts aren't there for when things are going well, right? They're there for when things go bad. Right. And I think that regardless of whether you have a contract or whether you don't have a contract, the point is that a good artist gallery relationship has everybody understanding like what the terms are up front. And if you don't have that, you can get into all kinds of trouble. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Hello? Oh, yes, okay. Thank you, Tim, for that um, amazing uh, talk. It was really interesting. I've been thinking about the football model myself for a while um, because I, I'm not a football fan, but I had a, an ex-boyfriend who was a professional football player. Now everybody knows. And uh, he told me about this. And actually, it's very elegant. They even have transfer windows. So yeah. it's like yeah, twice a year. I didn't, I I didn't was get like, into that, yeah. This is so elegant and civilized. And, you know, like, it's only this time and this time. So you actually, mm -hmm. you know, have time to... So yeah, I do agree that that you know we can learn a lot from from the sport world, um, but I was also thinking about what's happening or what happens sort of, you know, in for example like LVMH, you know, buys up smaller companies that com could compete with some of their brands, and I think that's kind of happened. I don't know, I, I, did I hear it right, or is it true that Zwerner was buying smaller galleries or? And, and or maybe not outright. No, like, I, I don't <laughs> think that that's accurate. Oh, that's not accurate. Okay, no, fine. No, no, so no, I, no, I mean, no, I just no, heard no. that. But I mean, what, what if that were the case? Because a lot of times when galleries are, uh, or sorry, when um, and I, I come, you know, I have a gallery in Dubai, and I have had many of my artists poached, and you know, at, at first I'd get, get really upset, and then I was flattered, and then I was like, well, maybe I'm just an incubator, you know, mm -hmm. because I'm in Dubai, and you know, I'm not in one of the centers. Well, quite yet, one of the centers, or you know, in the Middle East, it, it probably is. But you know, so I was like, well, then maybe I should just look at it as a compliment, you know, that you know, so and so gallery is coming in and looking at my artists. But obviously, only once they reach a certain price point, they're interested. So one thing is that you know, the larger galleries are not interested in um, an artist until they reach a certain price point. But they're also interested in artists from certain markets because it's a way for them to get those collectors, right? So that's also... So I'm saying, well, instead of, like, coming and poaching my artists and killing, you know, the, the business that I could have done, then you come and buy the gallery and then everyone's happy. That I'm just... I mean, I'm not saying that's what I want to do, but I'm just... Right. That's a, 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 it's not a sports model, but it's a... And then the other thing, um, I was... I just sort of... Observations... Um, is um, there are re other revenue streams, as we saw today in the talks. I mean, merch, artist merch, isn't that what, you know, is all the online, you know, like the other products that artists are making. So perhaps that could come in as, you know, well, if you get this artist, then you get also the merch deal. And then corporate sponsorship is kind of like, you know, whoever, you know, Virgil and Ikea and or whatever, like, I mean, you know, these kinds of, those are, these corporate sponsorships of, 
the art world that had already happening, like with big fashion houses doing a collaboration with you know an artist and. So perhaps yeah. that could be uh, a thing, but who would regulate it? <laughs> well, yeah, there's there's that, and also like as you're as you're detailing those things, which are all true, like those are deals that the companies have with the artists. They're not deals that the company has with the gallery necessarily. And obviously, right. like you have to navigate that. You're never right. just making a deal with the artist because, right. I mean, unless that artist is like totally done with you as a gallery, then they're just going to do whatever they want. Right. But um, but yeah, it's 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 not that that stuff doesn't exist. It's that. Right now, it's not anywhere near at the level and consistency. Like, you can't be a professional sports team without having just a huge amount of merch behind you. But you can certainly be a gallery and be a very well-respected gallery without going down that road. So, I mean, we can talk about whether or not that should be the case. I think that, I'm sure that'd be a very contentious discussion to have. True. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's just that it's not that there isn't the possibility of it. It's just that right now, it's not there. Right. But thank you. Of course. <laughs> thank you. So I think we are running, we run, run out of time now. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, so I think uh, there will be many more questions. <laughs>